Creighton University students find success through leading undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs. Nationally ranked research and internship opportunities and a global network of alumni prepare Creighton Blue Jays for lifelong success. Learn more at Creighton.edu. At Creighton University, students start a successful and meaningful future. Imagine doing original research with a renowned professor or interning at a Fortune 500 company. The possibilities are endless as a Creighton Blue Jay. Learn more at Creighton.edu. Welcome to Creating a Family, talk about adoption and infertility. Today we're going to be talking about talking with young children about adoption. This is a topic that comes up a lot in our support group. Uh, it is a topic that comes up anytime you get uh, a group of adoptive parents together, uh, and it's an important topic for all of us to hear and to think about. Here's a sample of what you're going to hear. Usually, um, in an adoption, there there are some level of something that is, that is scary for adoptive parents to bring up with a child. So this is one example. Um, and as much as the inclination is to quote shelter a child from this information. The blank, empty spaces we leave and the lack of information gets filled in with their imagination. This show is brought to you by Creating a Family. We are the National Adoption and Infertility Education and Support Nonprofit. We also provide resources in the area of fostering and foster adoption. I'm Dawn Davenport. I am your host and the director of Creating a Family, and you can find us and all of our resources online at creatingafamily.org. This show is underwritten by, with the support of the Jockey Being Family Foundation. They believe that every child deserves to grow up in a loving family and a forever home. You can find out more about their mission at their website, jockeybeingfamily.com. It is a relatively new website, so pop over there and, and check it out. And you can also support their efforts and their mission by attending their upcoming gala, the Jockey Being Family Gala and Golf Classic. It's going to be this month, May 20 and 21st, at the Grand Geneva Resort and Spa near Kenosha, Wisconsin. And by the way, that's not very far from Chicago. I'm guessing maybe less than two hours for sure uh, north of Chicago. So if you have any interest in, in galaing or golfing uh, or uh, supporting a wonderful organization, then pop onto their website and buy a ticket. As I said today, we are talking with, about starting over. Today, we're going to be talking about talking with young children about adoption and birth parents. Our guests today are Dr. Jennifer Bliss. She has a doctorate in psychology, and she is also a licensed clinical social worker, and she is the Director of Adoptions and Foster Care at Vista Del Mar and Family Services in L.A. We also have Chantilly Wajayasinghe. She is an adoption specialist at uh, Vista Del Mar. She is a Master's of Social Work and a Master's of Public Health, which is a really interesting combination. Uh, and she, as I said, is also with Vista Del Mar, and they both know a lot about the topic of talking with children about adoption. So we are so glad to have you both with us today, uh, Dr. Bliss and Chantilly. Thank you so I much. Want, yeah, uh, I want to start with you, Dr. Bliss, and it's going to be with a, um, a, a really kind of a, a softball question. When do you suggest that parents start talking about adoption with their child? And at this point, since we're talking about young children, let's assume that the child is, you know, either adopted at birth or at adopted at a as in infancy or as a very young child. That's a really interesting question, Don. It's probably one of the most common ones I get. And you know, a lot of people think or we hear the misnomer, oh, I'll wait till they understand what the word adoption means or when they can understand their story. And that is a misnomer that we're working all the time to try and correct because we want children never to have the memory of the day they were told they were adopted, which means we want to start this conversation before they're even talking back with us. You know, I usually use the um, common analogy, parents say to the children, I love you, way before the child understands what the words I love you mean. And the same is with the adoption story. So you want to start talking with them as an infant and talking to them about the story of how you became a family. Over time, they will have always remembered hearing that story. It will always be a familiar story. 
and they'll never have the first time they heard the word adopted in their memory. Also, this gives the parents a chance to get confident with the story, familiar yeah. with the terms and the words that they want to use. And so by the time the child is old enough to be asking questions about what the specifics are, the parent is confident and, and easily engaging this conversation without stumbling over the words because they're familiar with it. They've been doing it for so long. That is so true. I always say the infancy is a gift. It's a gift to you because the child has no clue what you're saying. So while you're changing Mm -hmm. their diapers, you can be getting used to the story. You can work out the kinks and how you're going to tell it. You'll get uh, more confidence in telling it. But, you know, Chantilly, I often wonder why do, and I am an adoptive parent, so I'm including myself in this, why do we fear the talk of, of about with our child about adoption. Why do we stumble on the word birth parent? I think um, because there might be this fear of that there's another parent involved and that there's another connection. Um, whereas the love is still there, and even though you're parenting the child, there might be a fear that the child is looking to another and that there is a piece of the child that might not be provided by you. Um, and understanding that there are there's so much that you can provide and that there's this otherness, that unknown and the fear of a child looking toward that other than you um, can be fear-provoking. So that's why another topic is openness and having information about the birth parent and being able to share information actually strengthens the bond between you and the child because you're also you're giving them that vessel. You're the vessel for them to access their history and understand different parts of their identity. Yeah, and I'm so glad you pointed out that because I, I also think it is a fear. I think that it's fear, fear that you said it beautifully. Fear that there is another. Yeah, I mean that's true. It's fear that we aren't the only, uh, the only mother or the only father, the only parents in this child's life. And I think it helps to own that your hesitancy and your stumbling. It has to do with, with fear. Uh, it doesn't make the fear go away, but it does help you understand. So uh, going back to the developmental, I mean, thinking through the developmental stages of early childhood, how how does that impact a child's understanding of adoption? Now, obviously, we just talked about an infant. So up until the age of one, the child, I think, mm-hmm. doesn't have an understanding of, of the words that we're even saying. But for the next the next developmental stages past past pure infancy how do those mm-hmm. stages let's let's take it up to say age 6 how do those stages impact dr bliss the a child's understanding of what adoption is right so as you said there's stages involved and the child is understanding the world you know with every passing year or two they're going to think of things differently ask different questions because different things will be important to them So, you know, up until two, you're basically telling them stories about them, the story of how they became a family. You can do storybooks because that's going to be interesting and relevant and meaningful to them. Um, And so you really have to think about where the child is and what's curious to them. And then, you, you know, you get into the three and four, and they're seeing pregnant people. They know that bellies are places that babies grow. And you want them to know that they also grew in a belly. I think that the whole, you know, antiquated notion that there's a stork or a cabbage patch or something where they came from anything other than a belly is actually something that would possibly be fear-provoking for a child. They don't want to think they're an alien or dropped from the sky. And so even in stories of adoption, we want to make sure children know, yes, you came from a belly. That's important. So, yes, you came from Jessica's belly, and she was growing a baby, but she wasn't ready to be a mommy. So she searched and searched, and when she met us, she said, aha, this is the family you were meant to be in. So, you know, I'm making it concrete and answering their questions in a way that's developmentally and age-appropriate, but still honest. At, at what point do children begin to really grasp the full meaning of, of being adopted? Um, and it may be beyond the the young child stage. At what age do they begin to grasp mm-hmm. that this is not the the typical way that families are formed, or that right. this means they have more than one mommy or one more than one daddy or whatever? Right. And 
So you know what? It's hard to say at three, your child is going to ask these questions. At five, this is the questions they're going to ask because it's all a little fluid. It has a lot to do with the individual, their own personality, as well as, you know, how their own little brain works. It's not going to be the same as the child sitting next to them. But it is thinking about generally preparing yourself for the types of questions, um, you know, at you know, like we said, under five, we talk about you grew in a belly, it was so-and-so's belly, and the basic concrete reasons as to why she needs a plan. Once you hit five and up, maybe even a long, younger for some children, you might get the more, um, I would say, the complicated or, quote, deeper questions that you might have to take a beat before you answer, like, didn't she love me? Or things that, as a parent, might throw you off at first and say, oh, my God, this is a moment, one of those moments where I knew I'd cross a bridge at this this matters, the way I handle this, right? So Mm -hmm. if it happens to be a question where you've prepared for, all the best, dive in. But one of the things I want to encourage parents to do is to give yourself permission not to know all the answers in that moment and that be okay. And it's okay to say, Max, that is such a good question. Can I think about that? And I'm going to come back to you with a good answer. And maybe call your adoption professional or call an adoption counselor or someone in this field that you trust to bounce ideas off of and come up with an answer that isn't necessarily going to be your knee-jerk response, which might not be the best one. And I encourage people within a day or two, you do want to circle back with your child and say, remember that really good question you asked me when I was at the checkout counter at Target? <laughs> I want to be able to answer this for you now because it really has been on my mind and I, and I wanted to be able to give you the best answer possible. That's a good point. Uh, buy yourself some time if you're not either, mm-hmm. one, not sure how to answer it, or two, sense that you're really feeling uncomfortable um, so right. that you, when you're responding, uh, your discomfort uh, is, uh, is more uh, in your control, and so you're not sending a message right. to your child. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes our gut reaction is not the right one because <laughs> if we're sensing our child is uncomfortable or in angst or sad about something and that, that feeling is prompting the question, as a parent, we might want to just abate their fears or, you know, make their sadness go away. And so we say something like, well, I love you twice as much as anybody else would, or something that comes from a place of maybe knee-jerk, um, it was, you know, comes from places you mean well, but it's not necessarily what they need to hear as far as what's the most healthy version of an answer for them. So give yourself permission to honor their question and seek resources before you circle back. Well, so what if you make a mistake? What if you, uh, or you think you do, you answered it in a way that you think back and you go, hmm, gosh, mm-hmm. I wish I hadn't, I wish I hadn't said it quite that way. Chantilly, Chantilly what at that point? Uh, thinking about, you know, upon reflection, you think, well, that wasn't, that wasn't right. one of my better answers. I wish I had taken Dr. Bliss's advice and, and given myself time. Mm-hmm. Um, how, to, how, to, um, uh, how to undo what you did? Well, I think... It it goes to the fact that it's this is going to be an ongoing conversation. It's never just an open and shut um, topic. And it's when you're setting the scene, even from infancy all the way up, this is an ongoing conversation. So it's never just shut. And that means that you can always revisit. And it's also a reminder that as parents, you're human as well. And you you have human reactions, and you can always say, you know, Max, I my first reaction and my first answer wasn't the full complete um, answer, and I've I've had time to really think about it and reflect, and now um, I want to just circle back and talk a little bit more about I have more thoughts about it, and so it's always a growing subject, and it's okay, and it's encouraged to circle back and be able to show that you also have a reflective process as well um, and that it's forever evolving between the two of you. Uh, yeah, I actually think that it's, it's a, there's an advantage there in a sense that you can say, you know, you, Max, you ask great questions. And, you know, I've th- been thinking about your mm-hmm. question. And I didn't mm-hmm. think, I, and I'm not sure I answered it the, the fully or, or I wanted to know if you had any other thoughts on it or this is what I was thinking so that in a way it gives you the opportunity to make it an ongoing conversation as opposed to a, you know, what so many people want, which is a one and done, which is just that's not how these conversations work. Um, this will be, uh, we always say it's not one talk you are having. It's going to be one of many. It's just 
little bits of little talks, not one big talk. And that's uh, that's how children grow up with the knowledge without ever having remembered being told, which is what Dr. Bliss said at the very beginning. All right, so we talked about um, uh, talking with infants. Okay, so what are some tips for infants, uh, and you know, up to the age of two, say, when you're mm-hmm. uh, infants and, and toddlers, when you're talking with them about adoption? Chantilly, can you give some some tips of ways to you know to broach the subject with your child? Mm-hmm. One of my favorite ways to talk about their adoption story is through a life book. Um, You can get them off online um, and just create a personal life story where you can even have um, a page saying, oh, this is, um, you grew in your tummy mummy and she chose us to be your forever family and you were born on this day and we were so happy to be at the hospital and we were waiting for you to come and that's when we became a forever home. Um, and then you can even have a page with um, a picture of the birth mother in the book. So that way mm-hmm. it's, the story is always there and always unfolding. And it's ingrained just into their every day when you're reading them stories to go to sleep. Um, and this way it's just part of their identity formation too, but they might not it might not click. Like they'll understand, they'll know the word adoption. They know that they have a birth mother, um, but then there'll be a later time where it actually clicks. And just as Dr. Bliss was saying earlier, we don't want it to be the day they they found out that they were adopted. Um, This way, if you have a life book, it's just kind of ingrained into their everyday. And so it's, they can just circle back and be like, Oh, is this what, Adoption means, like, what does that mean? And you say, well, look, we were reading this book, and this is, this is how you came to us, and this is how we became. Um, so, yeah, I think Dr. Bliss would probably have more to say about this. You know, it just reminded me that the first two years when they're very, very young is a perfect time for adoptive parents to get into their lexicon um, positive adoption language because by default, we might not, it might not come naturally in the sense that, you know, start using the words, she made an adoption plan. She chose to place you and make sure with a very short time, you know, during your adoption process and once you have a child in your home that you're using positive adoption language so your child only hears it. And so things like placing a child, making adoption plan, using the word biological parents, instead of birth parents instead of natural parents because you don't want to, by default, then be referring to yourself as some kind of unnatural parent. Mm -hmm. Um, And make sure that your relatives and your close family friends are also aware because if your child knows they are adopted um, and talks about it with the ease that we hope they will, even if it's not an everyday conversation, when it does come up, you want the people around him or her to also be using positive adoption language. So, for example, you know, we never use the word, oh, their adopted daughter, their adopted son. And make sure your relatives are not referring to your child like that. Think of adoption as a verb in the sense it's a way you became a family. It's a process by which your this little boy became your son. Um, but it's not an adjective that necessarily qualifies the type of child he or she is. Okay. And then, and then something that Chantilly mentioned as well that I wanted to circle back to is it, it, infancy and toddlerhood are when you should be having – um, adoption-oriented books, children's books, picture mm-hmm. books, mm-hmm. in your uh, in your library at your library at home. I think it's always good to own a couple, but you can also, of course, every public library has a number of them. And at Creating a Family, we have a uh, a great list of of books that uh, cover every aspect, uh, uh, every type of adoption and age, and uh, so. Start at the library if you want uh, when your child is an infant. Find some books that you like. And an added advantage is many of the uh, picture books also have a section at the back for parents. So you can um, get some information there, too. And we have a, a list of those at our website. Uh, go to creatingafamily.org. Go to Adoption. And then um, you can click on the, the picture adoption or the horizontal menu. And then there is a, a box for uh, suggested books. 
Uh, so I would uh, I would strongly uh, recommend that as well. All right. Now, anything different, Dr. Bliss, that we would throw in as our children are moving into preschool and, and approaching uh, approaching first grade? So is there anything different other than continuing uh, to uh, to read books and continuing to talk? Anything that we should uh, be adding in as they uh, approach school age? Well, it's a really good question. It reminds me of a funny story with one of our adoptive families that um, sometimes we forget that um, – our children know only the normal that we present to them. So, you know, just be aware that your child, unless you tell them otherwise, may not realize that not everybody chooses a family when they become pregnant, Um, which sounds obvious to us, but we had a situation where a three-year-old asked a pregnant lady in the grocery store, have you chosen a family for your baby yet? Um, (laughs) Which is a very funny story, but the adoptive (laughs) Parents are like, oh, I guess we have to talk about how different ways families are made, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that once they go to school, there will be conversations within the school where you don't want them necessarily just realizing on the first day of school that not everybody is adopted. So, you know, maybe have that conversation ahead of time and help them with their storyline of what they feel comfortable um, saying and the difference between secrecy and privacy and the permission for them to tell as little or as much as they feel comfortable with. And the reality is that young children are often comfortable with talking about a lot um, because mm-hmm. they, they accept what we say at face value. They're not, uh, uh, they're not developmentally able at that age to, to look at the nuances or even to recognize necessarily the loss aspects of adoption. And so they take everything at face value, and like you say, they may well uh, be viewing the fact that uh, adoption is, uh, is uh, the uh, most common way. Um, of having a baby uh, or building a family. So uh, it would behoove you, I think, to include some different ways families are made books, and there's a lot of great ones. We also list them on that same resource page I just mentioned before. Uh, But there are lots of different ways that families are made, including, you know, a a mommy and a daddy having uh, having a baby and keeping the baby and raising it. That's, you know, that's perfectly okay, too. So we can include uh, uh, so that our children have have a more uh, um, a more full uh, understanding of, of the different options. Um, let's talk about some of the common questions that young children uh, might ask their parents about uh, being adopted. I think it's helpful for parents to think in advance uh, what some of the questions are, so they can think through what some of their answers might be. So, Chantilly, you want to uh, throw one out, uh, a, an idea of, a, of some questions that young children might ask? Mm-hmm. Um, one common question is, well, why didn't my birth mother choose to parent me? Um, and in that, you can respond by describing what the circumstances were um, for why she chose to place and say that she wasn't able to parent you at that time in her life. Um, So with that, um, kind of describing the circumstances, it really depends on the situation, um, but that's why it's important with your child to have parallel conversations with them about just circumstances of humans and people in general. So it's not, um, I, I find that a lot of children who have come from adoption have a much broader understanding and open mind because parents are constantly talking to them about how different families are formed and how Mm -hmm. people have different inclinations. So they might say, oh, well, look, that that family has two mommies and two daddies. Um, That family, or Joseph is really, really good at sports. Um, Oh, look, Susie, she kind of has a little, a hard time concentrating, which might be ADHD. Um, Or... Um, also, you can talk about how, what I'm trying to say is that a child can also learn about really mature, tough concepts before they really learn the word. So a child can understand what addiction might be before really knowing what addiction is. Um, and to have those conversations just about the humanness of how people have different circumstances that they're presented with um, in a very open, non judgmental way. So 
that when the conversation comes about their birth parents and whatever, if it was a financial situation um, or maybe circumstances around substance abuse or um, just being a single mom who didn't have the support, that's, that's a gentle way to be able to um, describe it to them because they've heard about these situations prior to learning about it in the context of their birth parents. What um, did you know? Don't... Too, I... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. It's okay. I think, I, you know, the, the basic question that um, Chantilly said, I think most every single child who was adopted is going to come up with one day is like, did she want to be my mommy? You know? And, and what at the root of that question is, is was I loved? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important to address that in the sense that, you know, as parents, sometimes the inclination is to, is to rush over that choice in that, oh, she knew she wasn't ready to be a mommy, so she chose us. Um, but if you sense that your child is asking or curious about the circumstances of, you know, was I loved, was, she, was I wanted? And I think it's important to um, convey to the child that it wasn't an easy decision, that, you know, there was, there was a lot of love in her heart for you, and it was really hard to, for her to decide on this. And she was sad about it for a while, but she really knew that she loved you so much, she wanted something for you that she didn't have at that time. So even though it was hard for her, she made an adoption plan that she found at the perfect family. So, uh, you know, I don't want it to be overlooked that children don't want to feel that this decision was made flippantly mm-hmm. and, um, and, and to honor that choice the birth mother made. But, Dr. Bliss, what if we don't know that information? This often happens in um, international adoption and sometimes mm-hmm. with uh, foster parent adoption, I mean foster care adoption. Right. We don't know. Uh, the story. We don't know mm-hmm. much at all. What then? We want our children to feel loved. So, right. should we should we tell our children that they loved uh, that their uh, birth family loved them very much? Do we know that? Well, what we can probably say is, you know, I wish I knew more, and it makes me sad that I don't know more. Um, but what I have learned is that birth parents really make this decision after thinking a long, long time, and it doesn't have to do with not loving you. It has to do with so many things that, unfortunately, we don't have the answers for. Um, And so you can keep it generic. I think it's good to express sadness that you don't have more because it's probably what they're feeling, too, because at some point they're going to wish they had more, too. Um, And I think that's actually circling back to a lot of times parents in reaction to children coming to them and saying, I wish I had this answer, say, like, oh, I'm enough for you or something. I love you twice as much. And this is a perfect example of sitting with them in the lack of knowledge and the discomfort and saying, I wish I knew more too. Sitting with them with their lack of knowledge rather than trying to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not comfortable sometimes, but it's but it's probably what's, what's healthy. Yeah, absolutely. What about if your children, your, because this is not also not uncommon for children to say to their parents, I, or they're the mom, I wish I had grown in your belly. I, I'm sad. I want to have grown in your belly. Um, Dr. Bliss, thoughts on how to address that? You know, I'm not sure if there's one right answer. I think that, again, we're looking at the root of the emotions behind that question, and that's grief. It's sadness that I didn't, grow in your belly like my friends grew in their mommy's belly, right? Um, And so I think that we first should address the sadness behind it and that it's okay to have grief around the realization at different points of what it means to be adopted. But I think that there also needs to be part of that conversation is that it doesn't change the love, that even if you had grown in my belly, I would love you the same as I do today. It, It doesn't make a difference and how much I love you. But it is that it's okay to be sad about different parts of the adoption story. Um, and I, I want to encourage parents to make their home a safe place for all different types of emotions about their child's adoption story because at different stages there will be emotions. Not all of them are going to be easy. And it's okay if your child goes through a time where they grieve the fact that they aren't biologically related to you. You also had a grief. You know, it's hard to think back, but you also had a grief process during your, mm-hmm. most likely, during your journey to become a family. And that mm-hmm. happened probably before you met your child. And for them, it's happening while they're your child. But it's a process that you want to give them permission to as well. And 
You don't want to necessarily minimize their feelings about anything because then they'll stop sharing them with you. So even those uncomfortable feelings, you want to create a space where your child can talk through them with you and make sure yourself you're giving the messaging that this is a safe and okay conversation to have, even if inside it makes you uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Maybe especially if it's uh, if it makes you uncomfortable because you need to really be mm-hmm. actively sending the message that I, I am here for you. I'm not afraid of this conversation. I can be your exactly. source uh, to come to. So we've talked about how to have the conversation if your child asks questions, but not all kids are question askers. So mm-hmm. what do you do if you've got a four-year-old who, let's say you've mentioned adoption, you've read the books, but your child has never asked any questions uh, and just doesn't seem interested? Is that a sign that you should just you know, say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm finished, I don't have to talk about it anymore? Um, or how do you keep coming back to it without seeming like you're harping on it when it, it seems to you that the child is clearly not interested? Chantilly, thoughts on that one? Um, yes, I I think there's a gentle way to just casually bring up um, birth parents in conversations. Um, I'm thinking of one example where um, a little girl, she loved eating hamburgers from McDonald's, and that was often where the family would meet her birth mom, and her birth mom would always have hamburgers. Um, and just kind of dropping little hints of like, oh, you might love hamburgers because that's what your mom, your birth mom ate throughout her entire pregnancy with you. Um, So sometimes just bringing up little nuggets of information about birth parents casually just in the everyday um, can be a gentle way to just bring it to the forefront. Um, But if the child wants to talk about it further, then so be it. If not, at least you know you're doing your bit to make to make it an open, safe space to be discussed. Yeah, I love that because I think that it's so tempting because it, most parents are uncomfortable on some level with this conversation. So it is so tempting to assume that uh, don't ask, don't tell. And and mm-hmm. and the reality is bringing it up subtly then gives your child, it does one, two things. One, it gives your child uh, the opportunity, if they have been thinking about it at all, to speak up. Number two, it sends them the message that even if they haven't thought about it, have no interest in it right now, they know that it's something that you've thought about and that you're okay to talk about. So it's it's a twofer. You've sent out two messages that seem to me to be really important uh, for all age children, including in, in, including young children. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Let's remind everybody that you are uh, listening to an interview at Creating a Family. Uh, we're talking today uh, about the really important topic of of talking with young children uh, about adoption, and we're talking with two uh, great guests. Uh, They have a lot of knowledge in this area, Dr. Jennifer Bliss, and she is the Director of Adoptions and Foster Care at Vista Del Mar and Family Services in L.A., and she is a doctorate in psychology as well as a licensed clinical social worker. And we are also talking with Chantilly Wajayasinghe. She is a Master's of Social Work and a Master's of Public Health uh, and an Adoption Specialist at Adoptions at Foster Care and Foster Care at Vista Del Mar. Uh, and uh, we're going to be mentioning uh, resources at Creating a Family, uh, and you can access these resources, uh, including an, an, a large section on talking with children about adoption, and you can resor- uh, uh, access those resources by going to uh, creatingafamily.org, uh, clicking on Adoption, and going to the uh, A to Z resources, and you will find Uh, talking with children about adoption. We also have uh, a couple of different courses uh, on uh, this uh, topic as well, and you can access the courses uh, by going to um, the uh, online education uh, tab as well. All right. Um, 
what we've got some we had a question uh to, talking about siblings or other children in the family about the adoption of a child one i want to mm-hmm. read it's a little long um and it's a, it's a bit of a reversal because the children being adopted are older and she's uh, uh concerned about talking with her younger children this is from Maggie. She says, I struggle with knowing how to talk to my young children about adopting our two older children and worrying how they will take it and what they will take away from the conversation and repeat. We're going to talk about that part later, so we'll focus on the rest of her question now. Is there any way I can present it? You no, know, I'm sorry. Any way I present it usually presents questions from my four-year-old about where their mama is and if their daddy is and if their mama and daddy aren't around, can you take care of them? Uh, what will they do and who's going to take care of us if something happens to you? I want to respect the older two because regardless of how upset they are that their mother chose something over them, she is still their mother and the love will always be there or as or at least that's what I think. But I also want to make sure that the little ones know that mamas love them no matter what and will always be there to take Mm -hmm. care of them. So she's, uh, I think she's got a bit of a conundrum going on, uh, talking with uh, different stories between her older children, uh, and it sounds like they're more newly adopted, and her younger kids. Dr. Bliss, can you give any thoughts uh, to help Maggie with uh, with this question? Well, you know, there's so many layers there. Every sentence. You said I had, like, something else I wanted to say. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie, for um, a so, <laughs> I know. And so um, maybe we'll start with m- the most recent thing you said and work backwards a little bit, is that it sounds like the concept to these younger children that a mommy could choose to place her children with another family is scaring them a little and making them wonder, um, it is a family forever. How could a family really be forever then? And so I think it's important to point out the differences that the their future siblings, um, the, the mother of the future siblings struggled with versus, you know, who their mother is. And, you know, when talking about um, circumstances, um, life environments, and what she wanted for her children that she wasn't able to give, she chose she chose a parent who, who was. And, you know, I also want to caution in every situation when you are talking with children about birth parents, that you separate the life circumstances or the choices they've made from the person themselves because we never want to label somebody a bad person or give any messaging that somebody is in, inherently not a good person. Um, you know, they know that these children who are going to be their siblings came from this person and we don't want them to be worried or the children themselves to be worried that they inherited something bad. So, you know, I think that's always important to keep in mind because as children grow up and you're honest about certain circumstances or decisions that were made, some things aren't great decisions and can easily be, be, you know, cast in a negative light that could reflect on the character of the birth parent. And I want to caution people to separate those two things out. And as far as for her younger children to reinforce that they are indeed a forever family. And as far as what if something were to happen to my parents, that's a question that a child could have regardless of whether or not they came, their child mm-hmm. ad- adopted into a family or not. Um, some children just have that question, and I think you should honor it by giving a concrete answer and let them know who is, who is designated. God forbid something happens to them, who is designated? And answer mm-hmm. that question honestly, as scary as that question is sound. Mm-hmm. Okay, and here's a, a, a question that um, uh, we also received. Um, she says, my nephew, who is eight, is really trying to figure out the why to our daughter's adoption. Why would her parents place her for her adoption? Generic answers just don't cut it and cause him concern. He worries about her and why this obviously sad, bad thing happened to her. More More specifically, we also worry about violating our daughter's privacy by how much we tell him. I was really glad we got this question because that that's an interesting – when talking about adoption mm-hmm. within a family, in this case it's a nephew, but could also be an older sibling, Chantilly, how much do we share of our of our child's story? Because we're, we say it all the time here at Creating a Family. It is your child's story. It's, you know, it's not yours, and we, we caution parents about – you know, oversharing, particularly with, with infants, we caution them because it's easy to forget that this child's going to grow up and have an opinion about mm-hmm. whether they want this. But what about 
needing to, or not needing, but wanting to share some of the information to help explain and answer questions to older kids within the family, either a nephew or a sibling. That's a really, really um, excellent and nuanced question because it is. Yeah. Um, generically, I, I advise parents to allow the child to be the driver and take the lead of how much is shared with people outside of their unit. Um, and that's because the last thing you ever want is for a child to find out from a distant cousin at a family reunion that um, some information about her birth parents that she didn't even know. Um, mm-hmm. So similarly, you wouldn't want the child to find out something about her history from a nephew or an older brother necessarily. Um, so my thoughts are to share as much as you can that's already been shared with the younger child. Um, And then, because with this specific situation, I wonder if there's an underlying fear here that is the older child worried, so curious about these circumstances because there's fear that he might be placed and that a situation might arise for that to happen to him. Um, And that's, that's where I would go. Um, I would redirect and see where this question is coming from and try to um, establish security for him and show that no matter what, we, we're a team and we're here, and it was a different circumstance for her, but um, this is where family and we're here. So, and to see where those fears come from. Also, um, you know, concrete reasons and concrete examples are helpful for children. And if they're giving generalities, um, it might be helpful, for example, let's say the birth no place because she, you know, developmentally was just not in a place to be a parent. You know, does this little nephew have a 16-year-old babysitter, right, um, that he knows? And so that you could might, might be able to use that as an example and say, you know Marissa, your babysitter, right? Do you think she's ready to be a mommy? No, that could be a reason and maybe one of the same feelings that, you know, our daughter's birth mother felt. She wasn't ready, just like Marissa isn't at the point right now where you think she's ready to be a mommy. So if you have a concrete example that feels safe, that the child can relate it to and, um, and fill in that gap with, with knowledge, you know, um, that makes sense to him or her at that age. And I, you know, stress the concrete examples when appropriate. Okay. You know, and it, it raises part of uh, Maggie's early one part of her question was her concern of of that the, the her younger children would repeat information, and that brings up mm-hmm. the issue that young children, um, many young children, uh, I, I venture to say that probably most uh, who've had parents who've talked to them about adoption think it's cool, it's part of their story, they're often very mm-hmm. proud of it, and are uh, prone to share. Some might even say overshare uh, with anybody and and everybody. We all know the stories, you know, where somebody, you know, oh, you know, you're so cute. Well, I'm cute because I'm adopted or whatever. You know, child doesn't even have, <laughs> you know, the full uh, the full comprehension of the adults around are right. just you know shaking their heads. So how do we handle that? The information you you, you had said something earlier, Doctor Bliss, about the distinction between secrecy and privacy. But that's a nuance, speaking of nuance here, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a concept that most young children don't get. So how do we handle that uh, when we want to share information, but we also are concerned about who our child might share it with? Dr. Bliss? Well, I also want to make sure, one, you're making a decision to share something with your child because you're deeming it age appropriate. So at a basic level, um, you know, we always want to be honest. Um, and then aware of the information we're sharing. We want to make sure it's honest and age appropriate. And then if it makes us uncomfortable that our child says, oh, you know, I have blue eyes because my birth mom had blue eyes, to, you know, their teacher at school on the first day, maybe that's our issue, right? (laughs) So, you know, it's like looking at the why did that make me uncomfortable that he or she said it? Because for whatever reason, it makes him or her happy to share it. So if they're armed with knowledge, because we chose that they're ready for that knowledge, and then we follow them, and they're and as they get older, their feelings on to what level they want to share might change, and so it's important to check in with them that just because they were fine on for, you know the first day of first grade to announce to the class that they have blue eyes because their birth mom had blue eyes, you know first day of second grade that might have changed, 
So, Mm -hmm. you know, keep checking in with your child. Don't take it for granted because a year ago they were so upfront about it. They might not want you telling, you know, the person at Macy's behind the counter something about their adoption, you know, just a Mm -hmm. few years later. So follow your child's lead and honor what makes them feel good about you might have a child that pops out and wants to be the ambassador of adoption from day one. And so we have to make sure that we're fostering that and not unknowingly sending a message of shame and poo-pooing it or trying to shush them. All right. Well, you raise a really interesting point, and that is the sharing of some of the harder parts of our child's story mm-hmm. with her. The uh, We've talked about this uh, topic a lot uh, at Creating a Family. We've got a number of courses on that, how to share uh, hard uh, hard news, and mm-hmm. it seems universally uh, what we want is for our children to have all the information we have, and we want them to have it at an age that, that, that quite frankly, many parents find surprising, but, you know, we don't want to right. wait until adolescence to share this information. Mm-hmm. So somewhere between 9, 10, and 11, 12, we want that information. So we always say, well, you start young, and you start mm-hmm putting out the framework, uh, the, 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 the scaffolding, for, so that you can hang more details as you go along. So let's say, it, well, we're going to use this one. We've got a, a question from uh, Zoe that came in. Uh, she said, my daughter's birth father is in jail for domestic violence. He beat, his, he beat her birth mom almost mm-hmm. to death. And her birth mom is in jail for selling drugs. Do I really need to share these details with her? Wouldn't it be better just to say that they have gone away forever without giving the details? No child deserves to have this information dumped on them. Um, Dr. Bliss, can you talk? Let's let's Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with Zoe's specific question, and then we will uh, uh, branch out to some other examples of of how to share hard information. In this case, uh, there's a lot of hard information in uh, Zoe's Mm -hmm. uh, daughter's. uh, history, our birth family's history. Right. So this is an unfortunate situation for any parent to have to navigate, and I wish it would say that it is super uncommon, but usually um, in an adoption there there is some level of something that is, that is scary for adoptive parents to bring up with a child. So this is one example. Um, and as much as the inclination is to, quote, shelter a child from this information, the Blank, empty spaces we leave and the lack of information gets filled in with their imagination. And it's not usually going to be, oh, I wonder if they're working at McDonald's down the street. It's going to be exaggerated. Maybe they're a horrible person that ran off and did this or that. Or, and so at least concrete information gives them answers where they're not going to ruminate about it. As much as you can, and, and you know, let's talk about the birth father and the birth mother, I guess, here in this situation, because there are decisions made that, you know, circle back to trying to separate the actions from the person, because we don't want the child to worry that they inherited something from the their birth parent that now they're a bad person. So as much information that you can find out about the birth father's, you know, for example, the birth father's childhood, his upbringing, what things contributed to his life that created a situation where he didn't know how to handle his emotions and just acted out and had a lot of anger, and how his birth mom, you know, wanted different different environment for him so he can learn about emotions and decision-making, and that his birth father didn't have that option in his life. Um, and the same with birth mother. You just kind of tailor it to her actions and, and the different environment that she wanted for a child so they would grow up learning better decision-making skills. So... Uh- Zoe did not say how old her uh, her daughter was, but so let me mm-hmm. let me uh, say what if the I think if the daughter's two, this is not going to be a question. So let's say if the daughter <laughs> is four, five, or six, uh, mm-hmm. what would would you share the full information that they're in jail? Would you share uh, why they are in jail, or would you keep it more general at this age? I think we would know that at some age. Zoe's daughter has the right to this information, and that age is right. probably going to be younger than Zoe would like. And let's just say by mm-hmm. 10, 11, or 12, let's say. But at, at max. four, mm-hmm. uh, at max, well, you know what? That's honestly, I've, I've heard, uh, what, what age, actually, let me just stop and ask the expert right here. Uh, Dr. Bliss, what age would you say that children should have all the information that we have? 
Well, it's, it's hard. To, I can't say that again because every single child is different. So an eight-year-old, one child might be the same as a 10-year-old, different child. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to listen to your child's developmental stages, the way that they're conceptualizing things, understanding things, the way they're asking questions, the thoughtfulness, um, and follow your child's lead. I'd be hard-pressed to say a six-year-old should have all this information, but a really bright eight- or nine-year-old that is asking deep questions and exposed to things in the our universe anyway because of media and everything that children at eight are exposed to these days, um, they might be ready. So it, I can't tell you a specific age, but you really, it, and if you're unsure, it's okay to seek the gui a guidance from an adoption counselor or a professional mm -hmm. that might be able to help you through that with your child and get to know your child a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but point. I do want to caution everybody that before adolescence, you make a really good point, Don. All this information really should be shared before adolescence because once they're in that identity formation stage, then instead of processing this difficult information just as it is for what it is, they're at risk of integrating the information as part of their identity formation stage. And then we get into, am I the same as my birth mother or birth father? And so adolescence is not a good time to introduce negative and difficult information about birth parents. And an 8 to 12-year-old actually can integrate it easier into their understanding without them seeing it as a reflection of who they are as a character. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay, so let's say that the um, uh, your child's uh, birth parent, mom or dad, um, was uh, is is uh, or was uh, addicted to drugs. What would be mm -hmm. some language? Uh, and, and Chantilly, I'll start with you, and then Dr. Bliss, if you've got some suggestions, what would be some language you would use with, let's say, a four-year-old uh, that you would be structuring, giving the the laying the groundwork for more detailed information coming later. Yes. Um, so I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier the importance of having parallel conversations. Um, and to lay the groundwork of, of conveying what addiction is without even really needing to use the word addiction um, and doing it in maybe in a benign way of using like, oh, gosh, um, Johnny, like Uncle Johnny, really, really loves his cookies. He he loves cookies and he loves sugar and he loves. So you can show an addiction to food. You can show an addiction to video games. There are so many different types of um, ways to show that someone has that might have that issue. Um, and so when conveying it to a four-year-old, maybe. That's laying the groundwork, but then saying, oh, well, you know, your birth mom um, was really, really drawn to some things and wasn't able to, um, that affected her her uh, decision making um, and her thought processes. So just to keep it vague, but also at the same time laying the groundwork of what addiction is. So when it is an appropriate time to share that, that's when you can make that connection um, and for her to understand. I really like what Chantilly said, and I feel like as a kid I might say, well, then why didn't she just stop doing it? And <laughs> I like, you know, well, why did she just stop, stop mm -hmm. eating it if it was bad for her brain? Um, and, and I think you can say, it like, sometimes it's a situation, you know when you feel like you have an itch, if somebody told you not to scratch it, how would that feel? Or when you have to sneeze, if somebody says, sorry, you're not allowed to sneeze today, that type of feeling that makes you feel like you need to do something, that's the type of feeling that your birth mother had about this. And it was, that's, that's how hard it was for her not to do it. And it has nothing to do with how much she loves you. And uh, yeah, so that it's not, she didn't choose the drug over you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so that she, that, that would be a helpful thing to also share. Nice. Um, so what I'm hearing you both say is, and I, I liked uh, what Chantilly's uh, uh, parallel conversations, um, mm -hmm. and Chantilly, am I understanding that correctly? What that means is that when you're not talking about adoption and birth parents, you introduce a concept that's going to be an important part of your child's story, in this case, addiction. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the case of Zoe's, uh, you can talk about uh, anger uh, and that some people never learn how to, uh, they weren't taught 
uh, and encouraged to handle their anger. And sometimes their anger gets so big and they hurt other people. And we put them in jail because it's not okay to hurt other people, that type of thing. And then so you're laying a, a, an understanding when it's totally separate from their life. But then at the mm-hmm. same time, when in a separate conversation, when you're talking with your child about adoption, you're also laying the groundwork that your in this case in Zoe's uh, daughter's case uh, your uh, your uh, your birth dad made mistakes because he didn't know how to control his anger. Uh, in the case where we talked about with addiction, um, your uh, your mom had a, an illness or a sickness that that made her want to take uh, something that's really bad for her and made her not able to parent you. Um, I'm trying to paraphrase in ways that would be appropriate for a four-year-old. Uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Bliss, would you add anything to the uh, to my paraphrase or correct it if that's if the case might be? No. I think it's okay. exactly, you know, you know your child. And also look for cues from your child if this, if this is getting confusing or if they're understanding it. Um, and so throughout these conversations, ask questions to check for their understanding. Um, and then let them lead you in if they keep asking more questions or if it satisfies it. Um, yeah, I think you can make it great. Every single parent, I and, and I've talked with a lot, has always said that they feel like the information is too much for their child, that developmentally mm-hmm. their child is not ready. And I, I think it is helpful to know that, You've got to start because you want to. You don't want to dump it on them. So you want to be dripping the information. You want to lay that groundwork and have those parallel conversations. But you've got to be adding to that scaffolding that you've laid. And it's helpful, I think, for parents to know that there is a timeline out there because everyone wants to believe because we all think our children are are not ready for this information because we don't want them to have to be ready for it. So um, I do think it's helpful then – so that parents know, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> by a certain age I've got to get this out there and I don't want to dump it all at once. I think that kind of keeps, uh, that adds um, momentum to uh, tackling a tough conversation that in some ways, understandably, every parent would like to avoid. Um, you know, totally understand that. Uh, yeah. Before we move off to, of the uh, sharing hard information, um, uh, Dr. Bliss, do you have anything to add? And then Chantilly, uh, do you have anything to add? Then I'm going to move off that conversation. I would just say keep, as your parent, keep your radar up for teachable moments, whether it be oh, something love. comes up in yeah. a TV show you guys are watching together or, you know, they hear of someone they know that something, you know, someone they know's parent is struggling with addiction or whatnot. Um, and just look for teachable moments. It connects, again, it makes their story of their birth mother more concrete because, they're also seeing it play out on TV. It's, oh, this is how that looks, or to someone they know, and they know is not a bad person, right? So if they know that you have an uncle or a cousin that struggles with addiction, um, and they know Uncle Joey is not a bad guy, you know, it, it's a teachable lesson. So it's a reminder, again, I can't stress it enough, to separate the character of the person from the actions and decisions that were made. Mm-hmm. Okay, and separate the character of the person from the actions or decisions they made. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, another reason we had talked about how it's important to give them the information prior to adolescence. Um, And another reason why I think that's really important is because once a child enters their teenage years, the connection with one's parents, is it's different. The focus now turns to their peers. So already the openness and the ability to have that conversation and that open dialogue might be closing, um, or not closing, but just shifted. So you want to be able to have that convers- those conversations prior to their shift in focus. Um, so that's another reason why you would want it before um, adolescence and identity mm-hmm. formation in that way. Yeah, excellent point. All right, we have a, co- a question from A, and, and uh, the reality is we get a question similar to this probably every couple of months on our support group. Uh, She says, my son is six and has never asked any questions, so we have never told him anything about being adopted. I've been reading stuff on your site and took one of your courses on talking with kids about adoption, so I realize now that I need to do something. I'm a little afraid that I've waited too long and screwed my wonderful little boy up. Um, All right, so we've been talking 
uh, uh, for the last hour about the importance of talking with your children starting when they're very young and continuing to have little conversations throughout so that there is no one big conversation. But what if you've waited? What if your child right. is now six and for whatever reason it's it's just never come up? So and you've and and you whatever. You know, at this point beating yourself up is not the uh, is not the right approach. I mean, it's not helping anybody. So, uh, uh Chantilly, I'll I'll let you start and then Dr. Bliss, thoughts on this mom who wants to know first that she as she screwed her wonderful little boy up and two Okay, now how to have this conversation that he's six. Mm-hmm. Um, well, firstly, no, she has not screwed up her little boy in any way. And the first thought that comes to my mind is better late than never. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Amen. And, yeah, and it sounds like she's understanding the importance of having the conversation sooner rather than later. Um, I would first want to gauge whether he has any awareness of what adoption is um, and then try to integrate that into a conversation um, to try and not make it like a sit down, let's sit around this dinner table and convey this. um, this I've got news to tell you, Junior. Yeah. (laughs) That's probably Um, not how you should do it. (laughs) mm -mm. Um, So I would think to if he doesn't have any idea of what adoption is to start introducing the topic to him um and then gently um to try and break the news of like well you know you um you actually you grew in a tummy mummy or that you came to us through through adoption and then allow him to have the moment of shock or grief or um I really, I come back to the seven core issues of adoption. That's a great resource for any families. Um, And just, I think, for you as a parent to be ready to take on whatever reaction he might have and to know that it's a natural reaction and to, to just be there as security for him and be whatever it is that he needs in that moment. Um, And then the conversation will start now. It's better late than never. It's, it's not that bad. <laughs> and, Dr. Um, Bliss? Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, whatever emotions come up, if it's sadness, I think it's okay for the uh, parent to say, there was a time where I was sad too, you know, and that's okay. And the second I held you in my arms, I was so glad that the way we've built our family is through adoption because I wouldn't want any other boy other than you. Um, and be prepared for questions and um, be prepared to talk about the reasons that the birth mother chose to place. Um, and then also, even if he doesn't ask again, bring it up again. Mm-hmm. Because a few days later, even if he has not talking about it, most likely there's been things circulating in his head. So he might need the door opened and say, you know, I was thinking about the conversation we had when I told you that you grew in Jessica's belly and, you know, Jessica chose us. Um, is there anything you've been thinking about since then? Or what do you think about that? Or how does that make you feel? Um, you know, and, and do it more than once. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, I also, I always go back and say, go to the library immediately, get some books, and mm-hmm. sit down and start reading. And it's just, it, it, and, and then continue to incorporate into your nighttime reading. At six, you should, you're still reading mm-hmm. to your child. So Absolutely. incorporate it as a way for the child to safely come back and um, he's processing. So he can come back and Mm -hmm. oftentimes the books uh, are are involving uh, animals, you know, woodland animals or something. And so you can say, well, you know what, just like that, uh, that bunny's family adopted him, we adopted you. And then, uh, then right. the next time you read it, say, "I wonder how Bunny's feeling," uh, and right. and use it through the through the characters. And even mm-hmm. um, I have found repeatedly, even if the the story says it, the the book says it's for two to four year olds. If 
if you are your child has never had understood that had had no information about being adopted, it's okay to drop down a level and read the right. child a, a, a child a, a book on a um, a more picture oriented book, uh, and then talk about the characters because sometimes it's easier to talk about how Bunny was feeling than it is about how you might be feeling. So absolutely, uh, I mean I love that idea. And at six years old, once they start to be able to understand the story from different angles and talk about different feelings. I think a great activity between parents and child at six years old is to create the storybook together of how we became a family and oh, let them participate nice in creating and, and creating that storybook. And you can do that today with making color pictures. You can use pictures from your match and placement experience. Um, and go. you can do it either by hand or go online together and, and create a storybook together as a family of, you know, the story of your family. And there are some guides. Uh, Chantilly, you mentioned, do you happen, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, do you happen to know uh, there are guides, templates for life books online? Do you happen to know any good ones? Um, so if you're wanting to follow a template, uh, you can uh, you can use that or you could just go to any of the photo printing places, you know, Shutterfly, um, Snapfish or any of those, and uh, you can make a bound book. But uh, Chantilly, do you happen to know of any that you'd want to recommend from a template that, that asks the questions on a, and from an adoption standpoint to help you fill it out? Um, I can't remember the actual name, but I know on Etsy, um, the Etsy website, they have a lot uh-huh. of great um, personalized books that you can make and, like, baby books through adoption. Um, right. I've mm-hmm. referred, yeah, I've referred a lot of families to the Etsy website, um, and like you said, Shutterfly is another great way. It's an easy way um, to do that. Well, but the great thing about Etsy is you're supporting, a, you're supporting a, mm-hmm. a, a craft person, so that's, uh, that's always a nice <laughs> feeling as well. But uh, do, do put in the part about adoption when you're Googling, and, uh, and there will be a lot of, of, of templates that will, that will pop up that you can utilize, and, and, uh, uh, which will make it easier, and you won't forget anything. And doing it together, I love that idea. Uh, at this point, uh, your son is, and, and it will give you an, a, um, an activity to be doing together, and sometimes it is easier to talk about things when you're not staring at somebody, uh, when you are um, doing something where your hands are busy. Uh, conversation okay. often comes easier. Well, I wanted to end with uh, this. Uh, somebody sent us this to ask us to share uh, during this interview today. It's from Nancy, and she says, We have an open adoption. When my son was four years old, we had a Mother's Day party with several moms, including my son's birth mom. We were together when I explained to my son that my tummy was broken and that Kim had carried him in her her tummy, keeping him safe and loved until he could come to me. He turned to Kim and said, thanks, that was so nice of you. And that was it. (laughs) He is now 15 and he has an amazing relationship with Kim and his three siblings. So uh, I thought that was uh, a nice story to end on to uh, address some of our fear that we build up about, uh, about these, these conversations. So thank you so much uh, for being with us today to talk about uh, this important topic for adopted parents, but even more so an important topic for adopted people and adopted kids. I wanted to... I'll let everyone know that this show, as well as all the resources provided by Creating a Family, could not happen without the generous support from our partners who believe in our mission of providing unbiased education and support to those struggling to create a family. One of our wonderful gold sponsors is Hopscotch Adoptions. They are a Hague-accredited international adoption agency, placing children from Armenia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Georgia, Ghana, Guyana, Morocco, Pakistan, Serbia, Ukraine. They also do international kinship adoptions. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I will see you next week.